after the war, uh, they raided uh, an area to recover some uh, some buried documents. Um, and this is near a weapons facility that uh, uh, in an underground facility that was would have been controlled by Kamler. Uh, they they took 40 boxes of documents out of that facility, had them for days. Uh, then the Czechoslovakian government objected, and and the Americans ended up returning them. And there's never been any discussion or disclosure of what was in those documents. Uh, but this is right next to a uh, Skoda armaments facility uh, that we think could have been an integral part of a uh, a nuclear weapons research project. Well, let's get into the uh, World War II afterlife of Kamler and. How on earth does he avoid the Nuremberg trials? And the story goes that he dies by suicide, possibly in the United States. It's murky. Where does he end up and how does he not get indicted like other high ranking officials like him? Well, so that's a great question. Um, and, and that is the question in the book. And I think the book resolves it uh, fairly well. I mean, we contend that Kamler did a deal with the Americans. Um, we have some indications that his emissaries met with uh, the Americans in the fall of 1944 in the German embassy in Lisbon, Portugal, a neutral country. Uh, so we have evidence of that meeting. And in that meeting were the Americans, but also General Electric, and this would have been December 1944, um, uh, and this is on the heels of General Electric signing a contract with the U.S. government uh, to, um, under Project Hermes, develop a rocket uh, based on the V-2. Uh, so what you see is uh, a big uh, American contractor, GE, sign a contract with uh, the American government to develop a rocket, and then – uh, uh, members of the American government and GE meeting with representatives of Kamler in Lisbon in neutral territory. Uh, and then a month later, uh, the rocket team, uh, that is the, the core group of scientists, are moved from the Baltic coast of Germany, Pienamunda, that was their main research uh, center during the, uh, uh, during the war. Um, they're moved from there down to central Germany. Uh, as the Russians are advancing on Pienamunda. So, and that's, uh, that movement was uh, in an order signed by Hans Kammler. Uh, so he orders the rocket team to central Germany to an underground facility that he had built with slaves. Uh, we can talk about his involvement in the slave labor program if you'd like, but Kammler had carved out uh, millions of cubic feet of factory space, the largest underground facility ever built in central Germany, and he moved the rocket team down there. That's in January of 1945. In February of 1945, you see the Yalta Conference. This is the conference with the the great allies. Um, and at that conference, they basically divide up Europe and to different zones of occupation. Um, and these are going to be the lines for the post-war uh, occupation. And it's learned that this destination, Nordhausen, uh, where the rocket team is now underground, is going to be in the Russian zone of occupation. Uh, that's in February. So uh, by April, Kamler's signing another order, moving uh, these rocket scientists from Nordhausen, which will be in the Russian zone of occupation, down to Bavaria, uh, right into the uh, hands of the Americans, the advancing American army uh, in Bavaria, southern Germany. Um, so you have not one movement of the rocket team, but two, uh, and both orders signed by Kamler. The final movement of the rocket team was aboard Kamler's personal train, uh, and it comes in the final month of the war. So this is a time where uh, calamity really reigned, and, and large movements of, of people were very, very difficult to arrange. Uh, at, in fact, it took them six days to get from central Germany to southern Germany by a circuitous route in his train because uh, you know train tracks had been bombed out. Um, but delivered them to the U.S. Army. Um, within a few days, they surrendered to uh, the Army CIC in Oberammergau, uh, Bavaria, um, and. That is what we take as a strong indication that Kamler cut a deal with the Americans. Uh, the problem with that theory is that, Hitler, uh, that, that history, as I mentioned at the outset, history shows that uh, from there – and we're very careful to track Kamler's final movements 
uh, there's some excruciating work in documenting that he was in central Germany, then Berlin, and then Salzburg, but ultimately uh, ends up in Prague. Uh, and this is the very final days of the war, where Prague is basically the, out, the last outpost. Uh, and according to his driver, um, on uh, in early May, he has a roadside meeting with another general, and then walks off into the woods and shoots and kills himself. And that that's sort of where the the the, the history ends. Um, th- th- there are several problems with that uh, that story. One is that uh, his identity discs, the equivalent of the modern day dog tag, uh, were never turned in. His sidearm, his papers, uh, those would routinely be handed in to a POW camp or the the Red Cross or to uh, their own leadership. None of that ever turned up. Uh, there's never been a body located, uh, never been a gravesite located. Um, and Kampar, I mentioned he was very powerful. He was an Obergruppenführer, and your audience probably is familiar with that rank. It is the, the highest commissioned rank in the SS. Uh, it's a rank equivalent to George Patton, well, blood and guts George Patton. So this is the equivalent of losing uh, General Patton's body in the field, uh, even in a chaotic war uh, and that's not going to happen. They're not going to leave somebody like that behind. If they did, they'd certainly recover his body later. There'd certainly be a grave. Uh, but none of that ever turned up. Um, and then you know, 50 years later, different versions of his death started to emerge. Um, and of course, any version, uh, any two versions of somebody's death that are the death that are different just aren't in, they're incompatible with one another. Um, and these different versions of his death, I think, began to emerge as people began to speculate that maybe he didn't really die. Um, and w- what we have that I think really cements the idea that he did a deal with, with the United States is uh, our, a series of papers that show he didn't die at the end of the war. He actually surrendered to the U.S. Army. Uh, we had him in custody. Uh, for a good long while, interrogated him, uh, asked him about missing, uh, you know, missing money, gold, uh, bank accounts. Certainly asked him about rocket scientists. Um, had him, uh, you know, in uh, in Austria and then in Nordhausen. I, I think he was probably uh, at Nuremberg just before the trials, giving testimony against others. Um, and then ultimately, um, in the book, we lay out three scenarios uh, about w- what actually became of, of Hans Kammler. We know we had him in custody for 10 or 12 months. Uh, the, the paper trail ends with an extradition request from Great Britain. Uh, I mentioned Hans Kammler, of course, in charge of all of Germany's secret weapons. That included these vengeance rockets. Um, he, he was in charge of those rockets from cradle to grave. Uh, so uh, conception to production to actually firing the rockets off in the field. Um, and many of them were fired at Antwerp, but a lot of them uh, fell on London and England. So England wanted Kamler badly. The last note in the file, the official record, is a an extradition request from Great Britain and then from American intelligence, a note saying we don't have any objection to his extradition. And then the paper trail just ends. Um, so the book, the book then turns to three most likely scenarios for the ultimate fate of, of Hans Kamler. What are the scenarios? I guess in reverse order, I think the the most harrowing, but perhaps least likely, is uh, that he came to the United States. But you know that's certainly possible. You mentioned Operation Paperclip. Obviously, the rocket team came to the United States. Many records were falsified. Uh, in some instances, names were changed to bring people to the United States. Um, though those tended to be people with uh, with you know very technical, uh, highly sought knowledge. Kamler, although he was in charge of all of Germany's secret weapons and certainly could provide information uh, you know at, at high levels about those weapons, he wasn't a, a rocket scientist. Um, uh, he would have had great expertise in building underground facilities, and you know I could see him coming to the United States for that reason alone. We were at that time uh, starting to build underground command centers and missile silos. Um, you know, it, it seems like an easy thing to build a hole in the ground, but uh, these required you know there were there were best practices and best ways to ventilate them and to uh, and to deal with problems of moisture. Um, and he he had developed expertise in that. So, uh, and and we document several cases where folks came here with deplorable records, um, not quite as bad as his. Um, and then, uh, you know, some were found out here and, and sent back. Some were 
covered up for, for decades. So that's one scenario, um, but we don't deem it very likely. Uh, a second scenario is that with help, he stayed on the continent in Europe. Um, uh, there, are, there are cases uh, like that. Uh, the final scenario that we think is most likely is that he was uh, interrogated by us uh, for those several months, uh, maybe even longer, but ultimately uh, dropped into the rat line that you mentioned um, and shipped off with with our help uh, and, and perhaps probably new uh, identity documents to, to South America. And there are reasons discussed in the book that I can go over with you uh, as to why we think that's the most likely scenario. Well, yeah, please uh, mention that, why you think that's the most likely. Sure. It, it's it's really based on a sort of pattern and practice by the Army Counterintelligence Corps. The Army Counterintelligence Corps is the uh, the, the crew that the rocket team surrendered to. Um, and this also supports the idea that this was uh, as this was a done deal, more or less. Um, th- that was a very small cadre of people in the final month of the war, Army CIC. Uh, it ultimately became um, uh, uh, it, it ultimately uh, just sort of lapsed into history. But at, at, the, at the time the rocket team surrendered to it, the, the chances that, that that would have happened were infinitesimal, that it would be Army CIC people that, that captured the rocket team. So uh, that, that supports the idea that this was a done deal. But um, in uh, the early 1970s, um, a fellow Nazi named Klaus Barbie, uh, it's a, this might be a name familiar to your audience, uh, he's uh, nicknamed the Butcher of Lyon. Um, he was uh, discovered in South America. Uh, it took ten years to, um, you know, l- l- extradite him. But ultimately, uh, he was brought back to France uh, and tried for war crimes. Uh, he was a particularly bad guy. He uh, fought the French re- French resistance, arrested Jean Moulin, um, and uh, tortured people. I mean, there are. Uh, details that are in the book that I won't go into now, but uh, he was probably, uh, you know, his his inclination inclinations were just as bad as as Kamler, but he never rose to the breadth of power that Kamler had. Um, and he operated in France during the war uh, for years as the head of the Gestapo there. Um, and as the war was ending, the Army CIC recruited him as an intelligence asset. He had a network. This is Klaus Barbie had a network of uh, informants and intelligence operatives all over France. Uh, they had been tracking the French resistance, uh, but they had also been tracking uh, their other enemies, the Western Allies and the Soviet Union. Uh, long before the war was ending, everybody began to realize that the Soviet Union was going to be the existential threat uh, to America. And we started recruiting, we the Americans started recruiting uh, Nazis as intelligence assets. Klaus Barbie was one of those that we recruited. Um, we used him as an intelligence asset for years, uh, three or four years. Uh, during that time period, um, the French were clamoring to get him. Uh, we denied we had him. Um, and when the, when the heat really got turned up, uh, we dropped him into the rat line and sent him off to South America. And uh, as I mentioned, he was discovered, brought back, and tried. But uh, when he was discovered down there and and brought back and tried, that created an international incident and uh, some details about America's involvement and questions about what we knew and when we knew it uh, about uh, Barbie's Nazi uh, past um, were asked publicly. And our Department of Justice, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, did an extensive investigation and documented all of this. Uh, documented his, to some degree, his wartime activities, at least characterized them, but really documented his recruitment by Army CIC and uh, the the fact that he was used as an intelligence asset for years and then shipped off. Uh, And uh, the Army CIC leadership at that point, uh, it was divided by regions. Uh, The region that used Klaus Barbie was headed by Dale Garvey, a, 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 at the time a major, Major Dale Garvey, who ended up being a Lieutenant Colonel Dale Garvey, uh, and he was signing off on Barbie's papers. And his uh, signature appears in the paperwork that we have for Hans Kammler. So it's a very strong parallel case, and I think a strong indicator that Kammler went to South America, but it's not a smoking gun. And in fact, our hope is that in publishing this book, 
some of your listeners and some of the readers of the book might remember uh, you know their their grandfather talking about Kamler or a great uncle or somebody who served in the war or served in intelligence and find uh, you know a box of documents in their attic or some 